This week, we're reading The Winner's Kiss by Marie Rutkowski, otherwise known as Height Doesn't Matter When You're Horizontal. Hi, readers. I'm Jordan. And I'm Katie. And welcome to Not Another Heroine Season 2, the podcast where we break down the best and worst fictional heroines of any genre. (laughs) Because that's what we do now. Want to see what's next on our TBR list? Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Instagram for a sneak peek at upcoming content or to help us pick our next book. This book doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it well actually the the first third of this book matters. Yeah, yeah. Anything after that, you're like, mm-hmm. 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 filler, yeah. which kind of fits with the title. So yeah, we're talking about the Winner's Kiss, mm-hmm. the third book in this trilogy of the Winner's Curse, and this kind of is a nice tiny little end that's mm-hmm. drawn out a little bit too much. Yeah, but man, the first section of this book. So we left off with. Kestrel going to jail. Yeah. For absolute treason. <laughs> and we open in the winner's kiss with her in like a prison wagon. Yeah. The wagon caravan is stopped at like a rest stop is the best way, like an AM PM. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like they're getting some drinks, some snacks, <laughs> some Gatorade. <laughs> yeah. And Kestrel is starving and dirty. And she hears from like her corner of this cage someone speaking Harani Mm -hmm. outside and she's like oh fuck this is my my chance and so she like sticks her hand outside like the gates and like summons the the heron guy over Mm -hmm. she's like can you just deliver a message to Aaron Mm -hmm. Uh, like if you like as if she gives him a moth yeah as if as if this random heron guy (laughs) in the middle of like the northern tundra is gonna be able to get a message to the leader of his entire country it's like going up to someone on the street if like you were not a guest hey can you go like call president biden yeah (laughs) honestly it's a little bit like um white woman of her yeah and she's like oh yeah all heron or harani like know each other like the, it'll get to Aaron eventually. It's like, girl, that's not how that it's works. Not how it works at all. <laughs> but yeah, she's so sick and mm-hmm. broken down. She yeah. can't really say much, and she doesn't have time to. But yeah, mm-hmm. she does give him a moth and mm-hmm. says, "Give this to to Aaron and yeah. just let him let yeah. him know." Also important that she's speaking Harani when she does it. Mm-hmm. So just like hold on to that. Little yeah, tidbit. that's a very important little mm-hmm. little mm-hmm. note. And remember that she was taught Harani by a Harani woman, so it's like mother taught. mother taught. She speaks yeah. Harani very well. Yes, and then she gets to the work camp. She gets there and everyone is kind of like there's no chains. Zombied out. Yeah. They're just working and they're like happy to work. Yep. And there's there's guards, but the guards are kind of like chilling. Chilling. They don't care. Like they're barely paying attention. Yeah. And that's because everyone is drugged out of their minds. Yeah. Yep, you get an upper during the day to make you really excited to go to work and not feel tired and not feel hungry. And then uh, once that starts to wear off and you're like, oh, my God, I hate my life, you get a downer that puts you to sleep and you're like, ah, everything is fine. I don't even feel any cold and I don't have any blankets, even though it's like negative 30 outside. I feel great. And then by the time you wake up, you get another upper. And Kestrel's like, oh, my God. And it's destroying their minds. Yeah. Like you can only take this this drug so many times before it ruins you which fair yeah <laughs> and kestrel's first interaction with the guards like this uh like a female guard yeah. who's like all right like you're not gonna like this but everyone settles down eventually and she's like not super harsh with her she's mm-hmm. like i don't know what you did to get here but like this is the way it works here honey yeah. like here's your uniform here's your pick go mm-hmm. and like it's not overly violent it's just you're here to work yeah. like you're here to serve the empire it, i kind of got like sympathy vibes almost that yeah. she's like she can kind of tell that Kestrel's like, she's not very like big, bulky. And no. She can tell she's kind of smart and she's like, I'm sorry you got sent here, but like nobody makes it out. Like you just take your drugs and it'll go down a lot easier and easier for everyone if you just take the drugs and shut up. Yeah. And so Kestrel does a good job at not. She like, she pretends to eat the food and mm-hmm. doesn't. Like she doesn't know what's going on. So she ends up taking it, realizes it's an upper and a lower. Yeah. And or downer. And uh, <laughs> I've done drugs. <laughs> Drugs, I'm cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that might be the episode title. Yeah. I've done drugs. <laughs> we have it for legal purposes. That was a joke. Uh, yeah. And anyway, anyways, <laughs> uh Kestrel is there for quite a while and she realizes that I quite like these drugs. 
And so she has a period of resistance and then she just stops, but stops like in a Kestrel way, which is she takes just enough to keep her going. And Mm -hmm. she's still trying to find ways to escape. About a few weeks into her imprisonment, there's a tour of the work camp and it's a senator who doing like a health inspection, basically. Yeah. But in the middle of the night, the senator comes and finds her and he gives her keys. And he's like, this is from Ferrix. Which, uh, because doesn't she ask him? She asks someone. She's like, oh, my dad sent you, right? And he's like, no. Absolutely not, honey. And it's just like, I can't imagine the fucking like. Knowing that your family sent you there to die. Yeah. And then this, you know, is kind of haphazard, whoa, (laughs) haphazard (laughs) escape attempt wasn't put together by your father. It was like by this guy that you kind of. Kind of uh, was friends with, but not really. Yeah. To, like, you're like, oh, he's cute, but he's kind of stupid. Yeah. It's like he's the only one that cared enough about you. To and, help you. Yeah. God. Sword to the heart. And she escapes almost. And then she's captured. Mm-hmm. And then they bring her back and they beat the shit out of her. Yeah. But like clinically so. Yeah. I feel like there's tidbits during this whole chunk where they're like, we're not trying to kill you. We're not trying to break you because, like, we need the sulfur to make gunpowder. Like, we're trying to keep you contained, but we also need you to work. And so it's not in our best interest to beat you to a bloody pulp completely. Like, you're going to hurt just enough to not really do anything and give in. Yep. And that's what happens. And Ke- yep. this is kind of the turning point for Kestrel mm-hmm. is after she gets whipped, um, she kind of resigns herself to this reality because she's already attempted to escape she's like there's no one else gonna come and rescue me Mm -hmm. like what's the point yeah yeah because she's kind of come to terms with the fact like i committed treason i fucked up i kind of feel bad about what i did but i did it and i'm just going to drown myself in drugs well there was this so we kind of skipped over this in book two but there's this quote where it's It's the reason Kestrel kind of, after she is contemplating her actions and who she wants to align herself with, does she want to help Heron? Does she sit on this weird neutral middle ground between Valorian and the Heron people in the same time dealing with her complex relationship with Heron? Mm -hmm. Where she's thinking about the concept of honor. And there's this amazing fucking quote from the author, which is Kestrel thinking that there was dishonor in accepting someone else's idea of honor without question. Ooh. Oh, my God. I don't know who needs to hear that, but yeah. <sighs> if you don't understand your principles and if you're just taking someone else's, like, how how forcefully can you support them? How do you mm-hmm. truly believe them? Like, when it comes time, when, when the going gets tough, like, are you going to be able to stand by them mm-hmm. or are you going to cave? And I think I think that's what that really speaks to is if, if you don't know what your own idea of honor is, how can you stand by it? Mm hmm. And I feel like it kind of has been tagging along with Kestrel through her whole journey and, you know, heroine's plot, whatever, that like even in the beginning, she's like, oh, all Valorian children are taught how to do like an honor suicide. And like that was her concept of honor is this very strict like we're Valorians. We fight. We're courageous. We're not scared of anything. But she kind of like comes to terms with the fact that like. My people are kind of killers and they're doing heinous things to other people. And like, maybe I should gut check some of the things that I've been taught and inundated with as a child. Like, it feels kind of yucky. And it's like, oh, because it is kind of yucky. Like, you could pick a better path. A lot of lessons to be learned there for our modern society. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's too late because she's in a slave camp. Yeah, she's in a slave (laughs) camp. So that whole idea of honor did not serve her very well. No. In the meantime, our boy Aaron... I will say that the author is so good at these fucking gut punches of a just sadness conveyed horror. I can't even put words together for the scene of how Aaron finds out all of this. Because he thinks she's happy, eloped with the prince. Yep. And he, you you feel that he feels not as invested in Kestrel. Yeah. Because one, the whole thing with her confrontation at the end of book two Mm -hmm. where she's like nah fuck off Aaron like stop interrupting my piano time and he never understands what she sacrificed after that yep 
Yep. Because Aaron just thinks that she's like some stupid courtier, basically, and sold up to marry an emperor. And Tenzin very passively is like, oh, yeah, you know, they eloped off into the tropical islands. They went on a trip because they're so in love. And he's like, I don't care at all. Like, she's a bitch. And then Tenzin's like, unfortunately, she has passed away from a tropical illness two weeks ago. And Aaron has a coming to Jesus moment. <laughs> well, OK. And, ah! and and then they are still dealing with their alliance with the East mm -hmm. and fighting the Valorians because of all the taxes and the exports and like this is not gonna this is not gonna fly. But his cousin Sarcine? Uh yeah. Not Sardine. Sardine. <laughs> <laughs> not that. <laughs> comes to him and says, Hey man, like I think you need to take an opportunity. There's a visitor for her, you hear? It's this random heron guy who was up north and he has a message for you. And Aaron's like I got time. Just put him in a library. I'll get to him when I get to him. <laughs> okay. I love the fact that this man traveled across an entire continent <laughs> and Aaron's like, yeah, just just hold on. I, I'm busy. It's like, I'm busy planning a war. I got man shit to do. It's like, he traveled a really long time to see you. Like, maybe just give him five minutes. Aaron <laughs> makes this man wait like a week or two. Yeah. A week or two. Yep. Until finally he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll handle this. I, listen, I've been there. I've procrastinated, but like, Come on. Yeah. That's, so, a, that's a long time. It's <laughs> a long time. Just for a message that is obviously important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Aaron goes to meet with this guy. And the guy tells him, hey, um, here's a little moth. And this heron woman uh, gave me this message to give to you. And she was on her way up north. And Aaron gets progressively more, like, horrified. Yeah. He's like, what color skin did he did she have? And he's like, oh, he was... She was kind of like lighter colored, but she was dirty. So I like can't really tell. And he's like, like a inside slave, like hasn't seen the sun that much. Like what color was her skin? And the guy's like, I don't really know. And she spoke Harani like a native. And, and then that's when Aaron is like, well, if the spy was the princess, the Eastern princess, she cannot speak Harani. So it was obviously not her. So who the fuck else can speak Harani? Yeah. And he asked the, the guy, he's like, were there any distinguishing marks on her hand? Like, give me something, man. And the guy's like, well, I think she had a mole, like, on the little inner webbing of her hand. And Aaron has a cold <laughs> shower moment. He's like, fuck my life. <laughs> I <sighs> cannot. Aaron's realization and his pure horror, terror, understanding all of the building blocks that have been happening and coming into place over the course of three books. Finally, we finally have a sand castle. Yep. And <laughs> it has been demolished. <laughs> One giant wave and it's gone. <laughs> Stepping aside. I love this moment. However, this man, this random Harani guy is not going to remember some random mole on, no. on a woman's finger that he interacted with for two minutes. Yeah. Absolutely I can't not. even remember like what I did last week at work. Okay? Oh, no. Five minutes? I have the memory of a goldfish at this time, my friend. No. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how I got air. Anyway. But I appreciate it because we need yeah. that as a plot device yep. because yep. Aaron, like, yep, yep, yep. Yep, he yep he pulls out <laughs> everything. He's like, "Fuck the war, fuck this country. I'm going to get my woman." Yep, and he does. Yeah, with Do Rush do? with Rushar's help. Ah, that do. <laughs> typical, <laughs> typical Aaron though. <sighs> he like he takes like a pack horse, an yep. assistant, and Roshar, and they all travel up north, and they're yep. gonna break into a work camp with yep. a poison ring. Yep, and break Aaron out. Yep, or Kestrel out. I just love the fact that he was. Uh, you know, the leader of an entire country that is on the brink of falling apart. And he's like, fuck it. My girlfriend is in prison <laughs> for kind of justified reasons. I need to break her out. And it's like, you have a job here, my guy. And he's like, anyways. But also, I'm, I'm eating it up. I love yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> Go no, rescue no, 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 her. No. <laughs> All the nom noms. And he makes it up there yep. and he breaks into the work camp and then he stays in the work camp because he disguises himself as a worker. Mm -hmm. He starts to realize all of the same things that Kestrel realized, which is, oh, they're all drugged up. That's how they're working. And he's like, this is scary. Yeah. <laughs> and he finds Kestrel and he recognizes her from a distance, but barely because she's emaciated and like kind of mindless mm -hmm. and just completely zoned out. And he uses his fancy poison ring, knocks out all the guards, gets, you know, Kestrel like convinces Kestrel to go with him mm -hmm. and they finally get to the work camp and Aaron's like 
okay, honey, <laughs> we did it. And Castrol is like, who are you? <laughs> Oh, oh my god I, I was not expecting like a memory thing. I was not either this like amnesia turn in the story like one that's a very overplayed like trope but yeah. it works so well here for very valid reasons she was drugged out of her mind yep. and beat horribly traumatized yeah 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 yep. she's given up on life and then like this random dude comes and saves her mm-hmm. oh my god <sighs> and I love kind of the trauma. That sounds really bad. No, no, no. No, nope. <laughs> that's yeah. what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> of like the preceding scenes where Aaron is trying to, you know, drag her along back to somewhere safe. And every night she's like succumbing because she's like, I need this drug. I don't want to think about anything. I don't know who you are. I don't know where I am. Like, I'm confused about everything. You're telling me that I had some kind of role in some kind of rebellion. Like, I think I did that, but I don't know. And I don't know you. And I have icky feelings about it. But I also kind of want to be like hugged a little bit by you. And every night she's like crying because she really wants this like, you know, downer drug and she can't sleep. And he's just holding her and he's like, I'm so sorry. And she's like, I know you have some of this drug. Like, please just give me a little titty titty tidbit. And he's like, I can't do that, Kestrel. (sighs) And then they're also hunted by wolves. Like, yeah, the wolves. (laughs) Like big scary wolves that eat one of their horses. Yeah. One horse trope, anyways. <laughs> True. Yeah. That was yeah. actually a fantastically concise summary of what happens. Yeah. I love trauma, girl. Mm. Mm, me too. <laughs> I think that's why this, maybe there's something wrong with us. Because <laughs> this trilogy is like all trauma all the time. It really is. Well, well yeah. Like, the winner's curse is just trauma. <laughs> let's talk about this. There's slavery. There's mass poisons. There's mass Mass poisons in every book because the people poisoning, the horse poisoning, mm, yeah, uh, the drug poisoning, <laughs> everybody getting poisoned. <laughs> yeah, this is just trauma wrapped up in um, cute covers. <clears throat> yeah, he brings her back to Heron, <laughs> tucks her into her old rooms, and she still has no memory. Like she's getting like glim- glimpses here and there, but she's so traumatized that it's it's hard going. But if we want to speed wrap up Mm -hmm. this book, she eventually gets her memory back. She falls in love with Aaron again Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a new, like, in a new way. Because I feel like the amnesia trope in this actually treats it the way you would expect it to be treated, which is the person comes out of amnesia a slightly different person. Because they're not... They're not the same because their memories aren't entirely back and there is a different perspective on the memories. Mm -hmm. So we get Kestrel. And maybe this is why the second and third half of this book is less gripping because Kestrel is a little bit of a different character. Yeah. She is a little bit softer, a little bit more emotional, a little bit more vulnerable. She's not the cold-blooded, ruthless Kestrel that we get to know over the course of two and a half books, Mm -hmm. which is good. That's how like that's how Kestrel gets her happy ending with Aaron. They do. They go to war. They win. They weren't supposed to win. (laughs) Uh, And then Aaron and Kestrel live happily ever after, basically. Yeah. Because I feel like the amnesia plot point had to happen because there's no way they could have a healthy, happy relationship with all of the baggage prior to that. not at all. Like, it it just wouldn't work. It, It just makes me sad that we had to have a different Kestrel in order for it to work like it, it makes me sad but it's also one of those like it, there's no That's other the only way. way you know the the way it works is it's not that we needed a different kestrel we needed a different aaron mm, yeah the way aaron and kestrel work is kestrel has to change not aaron yeah because i i truly think this trilogy is pretty close to perfect for yeah. this genre as far as how everything develops and the characters but I don't love Aaron as much. Mm-mm. I love Aaron for Kestrel and their tension and the romantic buildup is amazing. Mm-hmm. But I think Kestrel needed a stronger, more ruthless character. Someone yeah. she can go head to head with. Which is so interesting because I felt the same way about the Hunger Games series. Did you read the books? Yep. Okay. I felt the exact same way up until the third book. Um, I thought Gail and Katniss should have ended up together. I was like, I'm going to die on this motherfucking ship until I got to the like epilogue. And Katniss kind of like comes to this conclusion that she needs something about like dandelions or flowers or something. She's like, I need softness because I only know how to be hard. <laughs> but 
<laughs> is that not Kestrel? Like, she only knows how to be ruthless and crazy and kind of psychotic, but for good reasons, kind of. But she needs, like, Aaron to be somewhere and soft and more emotional because, like, it, he has to show her how to not be a psychopath sometimes. It's a very similar, I think, like, relationship dynamic to Katniss and Peeta. But can you imagine what a power couple so oh, who's yeah, equally no. as ruthless as Kestrel is? Like, 100%. she needs an emperor because she should be an empress. Yeah, no, 100%. But, like, on, like, an emotional, healthy level, like, yeah, it's probably but, good. Like, but also I want, world like... World-conquering <laughs> level, like... <laughs> oh, 100%, yeah. Let Kat, or Kat, Kestrel be Oh, my evil. gosh. Here, <laughs> here is my fan fiction for this trilogy. Yes. I'm Aaron, listening. Aaron and Kestrel are married. They slowly drift apart. <gasps> and then they and then Kestrel gets a visitor. It's been like 10, 15 years. And it is Jess's brother, who she thinks died mm. because he joined the super special forces ranger battalion and he died in battle, but he didn't really. And he has he's on an assignment or something in Heron, which is its own governing empire, country, whatever now. And he and Kestrel meet, and he's a little bit more rugged and like less, I don't know, dandyish. Yes, less dandyish. Um, Girl, I am eating up every single um, sentence that you are dropping. Ah, I love like second found love. Maybe Aaron has to die for this to work. I could see that. Yeah, maybe he just like gets a disease and succumbs to it and Kestrel's pretty fucked up about it but she's like gotta have to be strong for my empire and she's it would be really become... fun if he got eaten by the tiger that would be a fun <laughs> full circle moment I like how campy that is <laughs> <sighs> yeah and she's just like cold and callous and she's like I can just be the crazy cold hearted bitch that I've wanted to be and then Ronan's like hey girl I'm back <laughs> I would eat that shit up not gonna lie that could be the like uh, adult version of the winner's curse. Yeah, because she's 19, 20. When yeah, I think she's, yeah, she's very young. <laughs> oh, no, here we go. Oh, uh, I got it. I got it for you. We are watching so... like, <laughs> brainstorming live. <laughs> so Kestrel and Aaron have a daughter. <gasps> uh -huh. And the daughter is like Kestrel, ruthless and cold blooded. And she's like, I don't know, let's call her like nine, 10 years old. Yeah. She needs sword fighting lessons. Yeah. And Ronan, who's this badass special forces guy, is like, I'm going to retire. Like, mm -mm -mm. I'm just going to settle on Heron. This is where I grew up. This is my motherland. Like, we're on like kind of friendly terms as countries now. And they hire him to instruct. And then Kestrel doesn't recognize Ronan right away. He's got like a beard. Mm -mm -mm. Got some scars going on. I, I'm going to teach your daughter. And so as he's teaching her daughter sword play, she's like, oh, something's like really familiar. And then maybe we can get like a new friendship, like beginnings with Jess. Jess comes to visit her brother and like they renew their friendship. Can we do this? Yeah. <laughs> I am eating up every single moment of this. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Aaron, you gotta die for this stuff. <laughs> I, know. I feel kind of bad. We've like been through so much with them, and it's like, okay, anyways, uh, you did your part. Bye. <laughs> all that to say, finish the winner's kiss. Yeah. It's excellent. You get all the wrap ups you need. There's some protracted battles and wars as they're mm -hmm. fighting uh, the Valorians, mm -hmm. but they win because, yeah. of course. Read the first two books in excruciating, like, focus and detail and consume every single sentence and then skim the last one. Exactly. Skim the... Skim once the, you... Yeah. Yeah. Once you get through, like, the rescue scene, mm -hmm. then you can start skimming. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did yep. on the second read through. 100%. Yeah. What a great fucking trilogy. God. And just some of the quotes, like, from the first and... From definitely, like, almost all of the first book and, like, the first half of the second book, there are so many fucking lines that just give you goosebumps. <laughs> what I really appreciate about her writing style is she's conveying a lot of like um, controversial ideas mm -hmm. or like ethical dilemmas. It's not flowery, but it's not so short and concise that you're and choppy like you're reading something young. Yeah, it's that right golden. This woman knows how to write a hundred percent, and to not have a bunch of like superfluous. Did I? Yes, maybe. I, I have a pronunciation that I don't think is right. Say it. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, I won't. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's fair. She doesn't have a lot of like fluffy stuff. Like all of the little tidbits 
in these scenes where you're like, why the fuck are they talking about like moths? And like, why the fuck are they talking about X, Y, Z? Like, this doesn't feel important. And then it's important later. Like uh, the scene with the spy. And he's like, oh, I was just cleaning up outside of the private meeting between the emperor and the Senate leader. And it's like, okay, like I didn't really need to know that, but thank you. And then it comes out later. It's like, oh, that was kind of important. Thank you. <laughs> that it's everything all is mapped out. Crazy. Crazy. She's living in 2097. Please write more books in this universe. Because So this author has other books, but I don't think she's ever come back to Mm -mm. this land. Uh, Or maybe she has once. Oh, she, The Midnight Lie in 2020? Oh. I have never seen these books before. Oh. It's a queer book. Oh. I love it. I love it. Appreciate it. Well, but I just, I don't know how you can have anything better than yeah. the winner's trilogy. Wait, Roshani Chalksky? Yeah, she wrote, um, I think I have one for books behind you. Um, didn't she write The Star-Touched Queen? Yeah. She reviewed um, this other series by Murray. I am. I think that's how we. I'm alive. <laughs> that's how we find our next books is we look for. Authors who re- like reviewed well the books that we like, mm. like the intent of those quotes. Yeah. See, the hard thing is though, because sometimes some of those quotes, I'm like, you got like paid to do this. Like, mm. there's no way you enjoyed this book. That's true. But it's like I don't know because sometimes it's true. Like I don't know. Well, this kind of kind of goes into like the different eras. eras. Yeah, so there was this, I was lurking on the fantasy romance Reddit, like I, I'm doing more and more often now, <laughs> and there was this excellent question pose, which is, what are the bread, bread and butter books of this genre? Mm-hmm. And this response from Blue Pancakes 18. Thank you. <laughs> I love that also name. fantastic <laughs> name. A little bit further down in her in her response, she says, it's like asking who do you think is most famous in music? Do you say the Beatles or Taylor Swift? The Beatles fan base and income weren't as big as Taylor Swift, but they've maintained their fame for decades and decades. It would be interesting to see what people recommend. Mm-hmm. That that is such an apt comparison. If we look at different authors in fantasy romance, fantasy plus a little bit of romance, um, mm-hmm. through the decades, yeah, because like the OGs, like I didn't even know these were a thing until you talked about them, and then you got all of them, all the, <laughs> all the original Harlequins, the, yeah, the Harlequin romances. That's like the beginnings. Mm-hmm. I feel like of books made for women to mm-hmm. enjoy, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially uh, from like a romance. Uh, when we're talking about like modern readership so yeah. stuff in the last hundred years yeah roughly yeah and then after that it was all of those like coming into focus they're like oh like women are 50 percent of the population and they like romance and they also like fantasy like we should maybe write some books for them like uh the mercy thompson series by patricia briggs it's like the og big guys yeah so there's there's women who broke out into fantasy really early on there's always like a thread of romance in there because whether you're a female or a male author like romance as like a subplot mm-hmm. is pretty consistent across all genres because we're humans and that's what we like yeah everyone wants to feel loved oh <laughs> And so we have this whole, like, section of authors who are writing, uh, I'm going to take a stab and say, like, 70s through, I don't know. Like, 2010? Or Yeah, 2000? like, yeah, pretty large time frame here. And we're like, Mercedes Lackey, Andre Norton, Patricia, mm-hmm. Patricia C. Reed, Diana Wynne Jones, who did House Movie Castle, Tamar Pierce, obviously Robin McKinley, Juliet Morillier also falls into there. And, like, all powerhouses, like great writing, great characters. They stay true. So you can always go back to these authors and, the, and their books and they, they stand the test of time for the most part. Mm-hmm. These feel like, because I don't really recognize some of the names, but I think I would recognize the covers mm-hmm. of the books. It kind of feels the same way as uh, how I feel about Metallica and like ACDC and Led Zeppelin is like they're there and I know them and I've seen them and I've heard the songs, but like I don't really like know them, know them, but they were like the beginnings. Exactly. And then we hit this like 2010 era. I feel like that's the golden age. It really is. It's like the Hunger Games, like uh, well, the so Winners Trilogy. like The way the Roaring Twenties, because you said the Roaring Twenties were like Harlequin romances yeah. in our notes here, but like the Roaring Twenties as like a period in time where it's like everything is fast and rich and glittery yeah i think that was the 2010s for books uh, yeah honestly because all of the 
the series were like well written out. You had like the girl heroine. Like this was the first time that I think like fantasy with romance like stood on its own in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Like we had like a movie series about it. Like the selection. Hunger Games, Twilight, Poison Study. Yeah. All of these came out around the same Within the same 10 years, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Because even the uh, Throne of Glass and Akatar, like were first published during that. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like we hit this like book talk fast fashion era once fast Akatar. Fashion. That is brilliant, Katie. Like that is the best description of like the modern Kindle Unlimited um, yeah. fantasy romance books. Because the Winner's Curse trilogy falls into that roaring, roaring 20s mm-hmm. era of golden age books. Mm-hmm. And then. We nosedived yeah. into a trash can. Yeah. Honestly, because some of these books, it's not even that they need more editing. It's like the plot needs to be kind of like reassessed because it's just like there's nothing unique in this. There's nothing interesting. It's just kind of like smut and that's it and not really intriguing characters. Because like you've mentioned it a couple times that like romance uh, if you're just going to have romance without all the like fantasy fanciness, like the characters need to stand out and uh, they do not in any of these books. It's like, OK, this it, is the same character 87 times and it's not well done. It's is what it is. It's yeah. like these, it's these shells of characters that are designed for like for people who just want to like, oh, I'm going to pretend to live in this fantasy and like have lots of sex. <laughs> Okay, so I, you saying that I had a brain moment. Um, did you ever read fan fiction in the like 2010s yeah. or three, so the like your name insert <laughs> that is probably what these authors grew up with, and now they're doing their own self insert insertion fast fashion books. Oh. Like it literally is self insertion, but they've just replaced it with some fancy, stupid sounding name with all of the your oh, names here. That, that is so yeah. perfect, horribly perfect. It makes sense. That's that's what happened. But on the flip side, okay, <laughs> on the flip side of this, yeah, I would rather live in an era where people want to write, can write, and they're encouraged to write, and it's more accessible. I remember hunting for books pre-Kindle, pre-Goodreads, where you had to get on, like, if you were lucky, you could get online and look at the library catalog online and Whoa. reserve your books. And that was it. Like, you had to reserve the hard copy book, wait three weeks, and then find random lists of people who had curated like recommendations. Yeah. But now you have like AI generating like, oh, if you like this author, read these 10 authors. Or if you like this book, I would rather have more options than no options or limited options. No, 100%. Because you always find those like kind of sleeper cell random only has like 800 reviews on Goodreads. And you're like, this is bussin'. Mm-hmm. What the fuck? Yeah, that is true. I just wish Book Talk would actually maybe like read the books that they're recommending to their yeah. followers or like think moderately critically about what they're reading because i have noticed that the fourth wing people are starting to like wait a second this isn't that good (laughs) you don't say i've seen so many like comments like that across all social media platforms especially with the second one they're like violet's kind of like annoying and it's like thank you (laughs) but i wonder if all of these people are people who weren't like prolific readers like Mm. early or didn't grow up reading these kinds of books and so like Fourth Wing and Akatar were their like bridge to the, mm. to reading more, and now that they have read that, like, oh, it's amazing, and then it led them to read other books. Yeah, and they're like, oh wait, thinking back, that was not that amazing compared to these ten other books. So actually, you know what? Thank you, Fourth Wing. Thank yeah. you, Akatar, <laughs> for bringing in more readers. Because ultimately, I just want people to read more. Yeah, because I my like personal Instagram and stuff, I see everybody's story and it's all like, oh, I've read 67 books this year. And I'm like, girl, with what time? It's like, I didn't even know you read. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you Malfoy, like, I didn't know you could read. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's like, I love that. We're in a renaissance era. But also let's let's if you had to if you had to buy all of these books or or if you couldn't post a picture of the cover, mm-hmm. like so if the oh. only thing you could say was I read a book by X and this was the title and you had no imagery to go with it. Yeah. How many more people would be reading? Oh, ah. well, yeah. Hello. Did you ever see those uh, books where you wrap up the cover and you just get like a brief description of what the plot's about? 
and you just have to read it. It's like a blind date. Book oh, that blind sounds date. amazing. Yeah. I feel like that's maybe what needs to happen a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Though, again, all of these covers look identical. Like, I cannot tell you the difference between the last, like, 30 titles on Kindle. But the difference between, like, holding up a stack of, like, prettily colored books on your Instagram feed being like, oh, I read 10 books and I recommend this one and this one. It's good, like, scrolling fodder. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Scrolling fodder. Because that's exactly what it is. Okay, Jordan, I'm dropping a little, like, turn there. I'm trying. I'm trying. (sighs) Yeah. Well, I feel like it's just a reason to listen to our podcast. We'll try to steer you... In the right direction, but sometimes we like bad books too. Yeah, <laughs> we like well written, well developed bad books. Because I'll read some stupid smut, but it, it, you have to like. I'm not stupid, you know. Like I'll I'll believe a little bit. Like obviously yeah. bloody slutty and pathetic, but it was well written. It was well written. I'll give you that <laughs> one. Like it drew me into. <sighs> ah, yeah. I need a little plot with my porn. <laughs> <laughs> That is the summation of the fast fashion book talk. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Um, I another got, news. I got no words for that. <laughs> We're just gonna transition. Um, I am rewatching Lord of the Rings, and I saw Legolas, and I'm like, "You're pretty, you're cute." And then I saw Aragorn. Your girl is now an Aragorn girly. I'm in my Aragorn era. <laughs> when you texted me that last <laughs> night, praise Jesus, <sighs> you have arrived. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I mean, he, his hair, the like ruggedness, the, mm. his voice too, the, the voice, the ruggedness, the like the quiet, reserved, but like I'm gonna rip my sword out and defeat all of these orcs. Yep, yep. See, that's another parallel. Uh, you know, we're in this era where everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, Legolas, he's so pretty, and he has long blonde hair." We need people to get past that and to come into their mature age of liking Aragorn. Once we get our books to that, we will be living in the actual golden age, you know, the, a utopia of books. <laughs> I feel like the final the final progression in this is like, well, Gimli's not so bad. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I mean, height doesn't matter when you're horizontal. Oh my god. <laughs> We're stopping there before we commit any more crimes. From our not just... quite at Gimli. Not yet. From our shelf to yours. We'll see you on the next page. <laughs> Hi, readers. If you'd like to help us pick our next book, send us a message on Instagram. Or if you'd like to just listen, we post new episodes every Monday and Wednesday on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. Thanks for listening. Bussin'.